guys. Are you ready to read chapter seven? I'm loving this book so far. It's so good. Hopefully you've been able to make some predictions about maybe who some ever afters are that might be new and what happened in chapter six. Oh my goodness, those cute little bunnies were just not so cute, were they? Whew. All right, let's get reading. That's the best you can do, Puck shouted, spinning on his heels and transforming into a massive 13 foot brown bear. He roared so viciously that Sabrina felt it in her toes, but it didn't intimidate the rabbits. They dove in onto him in waves, knocking his mammoth body onto the ground and covering him from head to toe. Puck, the girl shouted, terrified that he'd been killed. And for a brief moment, it seemed as if their fear were true. But the boy soared out of the bunny pile and into the sky, giant wings flapping. He dipped back down and snatched each girl by the hand and began an awkward effort to fly out of the forest. Next time, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell me to shut up, Puck cried. As if you would listen, Sabrina snarled. I'm going to have nightmares about this, Daphne sobbed. Bunnies are ruined for me for ever. Puck sailed through the woods, barely managing to avoid the giant cedar tree and fir tree that seemed to appear just out of nowhere. He ducked between branches and flapped fiercely to soar over, um, over the brush and brush bushes on the forest floor. One desperate effort to dodge a huge maple tree forced him to dive close to the ground where one of the rabbits leaped up and sank its teeth into Daphne's pant leg. She shook it off and it disappeared into the furry sea below. Head for the river, Sabrina cried. They can't follow us over the water. Puck frowned at her. I know what I'm doing, he growled. If you knew what you were doing, we wouldn't have a two million zombie bunnies chasing after us, she shouted. Guys, Daphne said, trying to get their attention. How am I supposed to know that the kid was mentally unhinged, Puck asked. I don't know, Sabrina barked. Maybe when we found him running from a skeleton? Guys, Daphne shouted. What? Puck and Sabrina snapped. Look out! Sabrina looked up to see a two-story high fence in front of them. Puck made a desperate swerve and narrowly missed smashing into it, then dove right back into the argument. I don't know why I'm always getting this, uh, getting in, Excuse me. I don't know why I'm involved in this anyways, he cried. I'm one of the bad guys. <laughs> the only bad thing about you is your breath, Sabrina shouted. All we ever hear about is Puck the villain. The kind of villain has cream corn all over his shirt. You want to see how bad I can be, he growled. I'll show you. Puck soared into the backyard of someone's house where they saw a stock, we saw a stocky senior citizen puttering around. As a trio flew over the man, they heard him shout, Agnes, the rabbits have been digging up the yard again. I swear the next time I'm going to wish, uh, I'm going to wish it had never been born. Puck howled with laughter as he let the bunnies right through the poor man's yard. By the time the old fellow saw them coming, it was too late. The bunny stampeded over him and Sabrina caught the glimpse of his shocked face as the bunnies knocked him to the ground. That was mean, Daphne shouted at Puck. You ain't seen nothing yet, the boy crowed. Flapping uh, vigorously, the boy flew across the street just as an old woman's car began to stop at an intersection. She was a tiny old woman who could barely see over her dashboard. She must have been legally blind too because she waited patiently, unblinking, for Puck and the two girls to fly across the road, followed by a couple thousand rabbits. When she, um, when her way was clear, she drove, drove off as if nothing unusual had happened. People are going to see us. You've got to get off the streets, Sabrina insisted. Your wish is my command, Puck yelled. He flew straight towards the house as a tall man opened his front door. When he bent over to pick up his newspaper, Puck threw the open door, dragging the girls along. No, don't, Daphne cried, as Puck sailed through the living room with a wave of rabbits tumbling through the house behind them. Puck flew into the dining room with, where two small children were setting the table. Obvious to, to what 
of was headed in their direction, uh, oblivious, excuse me, of what was headed in their direction. There was no busy, no busy, excuse me, there were, I lost my spot. There were, bleh, there were too busy, hungrily, they were too busy, hungrily eyeing a glistening golden ham on the center of the uh, dinner feast. Daphne accidentally kicked the ham bowl and the mashed potatoes onto the floor. Two um, hyperactive English Springer Spaniels raced into the room and tore into the fallen, fallen food. A moment later, the entire family was drowning in bunnies. Puck flew to the kitchen, then blasted through the back door and zipped outside. The rabbits crashed through the window and knocked the back door off its hinges, graining ground with every second. Sabrina looked up, up, up at Puck and saw the smug grin on his face. Are you proud of yourself? She snapped. Yes, he said. They're still coming, Sabrina or Daphne cried. We have to go somewhere that they can't. We're on our way, Puck said, and soon they were out of the uh, of the out of the neighbor's neighborhood and flying over the overgrown woods. In no time, the Hudson River stretched out before them. A tiny island sat in the middle with the ruins of what looked like a dilapidated castle. If we fly over the Hudson, they won't be able to follow, Sabrina said. Oh, we're going over the river all right, but not to save you from the rabbits, Puck cried. We're going over because you questioned my villainous, villain, villainy, villainy. Uh, Sabrina looked at, uh, into his face. You wouldn't dare. That's another thing you shouldn't question. He flapped his wings so hard and soon the three were soaring over the rocky cliffs high above the churning Hudson. Sabrina watched the rabbits race to the cliff's edge and then stop abruptly. I hope you two brought some towels, Puck said. Don't do it, Sabrina demanded. But before uh, Puck could dump them into the icy water, his body buckled as if he had flown into a brick wall. Sabrina lost her grip on him and dropped, and they dropped like a stone, leaning hard in the freezing river below. She sank deep into the water, then swam frantically to, the, to reach the surface in time to see Daphne splash down beside her. Daphne, she screamed. She dove into the water and after several moments of frenzied searching, she all, uh, her already numb fingers found something soft and it was Daphne. Sabrina wrapped her arms around her sister and pulled her to the surface. The little girl gasped for air and started choking as a mouthful of water spilled from her lips. Where's Puck? She asked between painful coughs. Sabrina scanned the waves nearby, but there was no sign of the boy. Puck! She shouted, but there was no response, and the girls uh, took tur turns calling for him. You need to get to shore. You can swim there on your own, Sabrina asked. Can you swim there on your own, Sabrina asked. Daphne nodded, but her face was panicked. He's tough, Sabrina reminded her. Just get to shore. I'll keep looking. She let her sister go, and the little girl dog paddled towards land. Luckily, their father had ta taught them how to swim at the YMCA near the old apartment, and Daphne was like a fish. She'd be fine. Pop! Sabrina shouted again, and when she, he didn't respond, she took a deep breath and dove back into the cold water. She swam in circles back and forth, searching in the murky waves with her hands, but finding nothing. Finally, her lungs ached for oxygen, and she was forced to return to the surface. Gasping for breath, she noticed something odd floating in the distance. When she looked closer, she knew what it was, a striped blue rugby shirt. She swam as hard as she could and found Puck face down in the water and she turned him over. His face was blue. She had to get him to shore. She, she had to get him to shore. She wrapped one arm around his cold body and swam as best as she could. Once she reached the shore, Daphne held, um, helped her drag the motionless boy onto the dry ground. Please don't be dead, Puck, the little girl cried. Stand back, Sabrina said. I'm going to try CPR. She tilted the boy's head back and <clears throat> looked in his mouth for obstructions, remembering the life-saving lessons they taught her in the school. Her only experience was a rubber dummy, never a real person, a live person. She tried not to think about the C-minus she got in the course. 
Sabrina took a deep breath and placed her mouth on Puck's, blowing all her air down his windpipe, and nothing happened. She did it again and then remembered she needed to press on his sternum to force in and out, uh, force air in and out of his lungs. She counted off 15 compressions for the palm of her hand and returned to blowing into his mouth. Suddenly, his eyes opened and he shoved Sabrina away. Ah, I'm contaminated, he cried, wiping his mouth. Puck, you're alive, Sabrina, Daphne shouted and hugged the boy. Of course I'm alive, the boy said, crawling to his feet. A dip in the river can't kill the trickster king. We thought you were... I tried, Sabrina stammered. Uh, I tried, Sabrina stammered. You thought you'd give me a kiss while I was napping? Puck said indignantly. I'm going to have to stop taking baths. I'm going to have to stop taking baths if you can't keep your hands to yourself. Sabrina was so angry that she was sure steam was coming off her ears. What happened? Daphne asked. We slammed into the barrier. The one, uh, the one that keeps ever after is from leaving Fairport Landing. Magic is pretty hard. Puck laughed. You think this is funny? Sabrina snapped. We could have died out there. Now you're just being dramatic, he said. Children, a soft voice called out from behind them. They spun around and found Miss White standing on the banks of the river. We need to get you out of this cold. Well, I knew something was strange. I never had a student ask for me, ask for detention before, the pretty teacher said, winking at Daphne, who sat on the front seat of the car with her. Puck and Sabrina shivered in the back seat under blankets. Knowing your father as I did, I figured the two of you were up to something, so I thought I'd better come down to the detention room and find out for sure. When I got there, the Queen of Hearts was trying to fight off a monster with a chair, she continued. Was it a giant spider or a frog girl? Sabrina asked. Neither, Snow White replied. It was more like a wolf or a gorilla or, well, both? Another monster, Daphne said. This town is lousy with them, Puck said. I think it ate Charlie. <laughs> it is going, it's going after the queen next, but luckily for her, I arrived and fought it off, but it was so strong. What did you do? Asked Daphne. Nothing, I didn't have to. Wendell saved us. Hmm. The teacher continued. He blew on his harmonica and the music seemed to stop the monster at least for a second before it jumped out of the window and ran off. Wendell was chasing after it when uh, you saw him, and I tried to tell you, but you didn't listen. How do you know he was trying to save you? Maybe he was trying to help that thing escape, Sabrina said. Oh, no, uh, Snow White argued. The sweet boy had nothing to do with this. Miss White, when, uh, when we confronted him, he sent an army of rabbits after us, Sabrina said. Besides, you can't put anything past him ever after. Sabrina! Daphne cried. What's that supposed to mean? The teacher asked. No offense, Sabrina replied, but everything about your kind is deceptive. You hide behind magic, and when something bad happens, you make it disappear. Poop. None of the kids at school will remember Mr. Grabner, and tomorrow they won't remember Charlie. Then there's the fact that ever afters wish my family was dead. I'm not hiding, young lady, Miss White replied coolly. coolly. As she pulled her car into Granny's driveway, and I don't wish your family was dead. Not all ever afters are alike. Before Sabrina could argue, Granny Rilda and Elvis uh, came running out to meet them. Wiblings, where have you been? Their grandmother said, rushing down the driveway to, as the children climbed out of the car. Elvis was so excited to see Daphne, he accidentally knocked her down with a series of excited kisses. In the river? the little girl said. It was fun, but very cold. In the river, Granny Rilda asked. Why were you in the river? Um, the rabbits chased us there, Daphne replied matter-of-factly. The old woman threw her hands in the air. What are you talking about? Um, I found them near Bannerman's Island. They've had quite an afternoon, Rilda, Miss White said as she got out of the car. They could use some warm clothes and some soap. Thank you for bringing them home, Snow, the old woman said, 
um, talking to, uh, taking the teacher's hand. Oh, it's my pleasure, Snow said. She turned and went back to the car. Then, but then suddenly she turned and eyed Sabrina. I hope you think about what I said. You can't judge the many by the actions of just a few. Granny raised a cautious eyebrow at Sabrina as the teacher dove, drove away, but didn't press the granddaughter for an explanation. Liblings, we have to get into the bath, the old woman said. Daphne, you go first and make the water good and warm. Daphne nodded and shot Sabrina an angry look and rushed to the house with Elvis at her heels. I think I'll go to my room, Puck said. Absolutely not, Granny Rolda commanded. You're next in the bathtub. The boy's, uh, boy's face tightened as if he had been hidden into a lemon. I have a reputation, you know. What will people think if they hear an old lady is forcing me to use soap and water every 10 minutes? I'll have to, I'll be the lacking stuff of the tree gnomes, pixies, hobgoblins, and brownie um, from here to Wonderland. Everyone is going to have to think a little less of you, then Granny said. No rush upstairs and change out of those clothes. Puck pouted, but Granny Relda didn't budge. After several moments of trying to stare her down, he spun around and stomped into the house. You too, the old woman said to Sabrina. Run upstairs and put on your bathrobe. Then come back down. I could use your help with dinner. The, um, the old uh, I need your help routine, the little girl thought as she uh, plodded up the stairs, up the steps. Nine times out of 10, when an adult asked a kid for help with something, it meant they were planning a lecture. Once she was out of her clothes and into a warm robe, she headed back downstairs, passing the bathroom door, where she could hear Daphne begging Elvis to get in the tub with her. A tremendous splash told Sabrina the little girl had gotten her wish. When she passed Puck's room, she heard a horrible smashing sound inside. Apparently, the idea of another bath was not sitting well with the trickster king. Sabrina, is that you, Liveling? Granny called for Sabrina, to, and she came down the stairs. The little girl followed the voice and found the old woman in the kitchen, putting, putting a pot of broth on the stove. Once it was in place, she turned to a cutting board and chopped the carrots and onions and celery into plate pieces. Uh, what are you making? Sabrina asked Gar sarcastically. Kangaroo tail soup or cream of fungus? Chicken noodle soup, Granny replied. Why don't you have a seat on a stool? And uh, I think it's time that you and I had a talk. Sabrina rolled her eyes, but she sat down. You've got a lot of anger in you, child, uh, said Granny Rilda. Sure, she was angry, but who wouldn't be? She was tired of the secrets and the lies and tired of things being hidden behind disguises. Tired of surprises that popped out every single day. No one in this town was what it seemed. One of them had their, her parents. Who was she, was she supposed to walk around making friends and passing out cookies? I get angry too, her grandmother continued. My son and daughter-in-law are out there somewhere and I can't find them. Every night after you girls go to sleep, I ask Mira to let me, uh, let me take a look at them. In a way, it makes me happy that they are still there, sleeping so peacefully, not even knowing all the trouble we're uh, going through to find them. But a lot of times, it just makes things worse. Some nights I crawl back into bed and want to scream. Granny said, tossing the vegetables into the boiling broth. I blame myself for not being able to find them. After all, there's no more magic in books in this house than a 10,000 fairy tale. After all, there's more magic and books in this house than in 10,000 fairy tales combined. And yet, I'm no closer to bringing them home than I was a year ago. Sometimes I'll look around this town and wonder if the person responsible for all my heartache is sitting next to me in the coffee shop, or maybe the lady behind me in the line at the supermarket, or the woman who styles my hair in the beauty parlor. Maybe it's a nice man filling in the, at the filling station who pumps the gas into my car. Maybe it's a paper boy or the mailman or the girl who sells cookies at the Girl Scouts. Sabrina's heart began to rise. Granny felt exactly the way she did. Why hadn't she said her true feelings before about the Ever Afters? Uh, it would have kept her from feeling so guilty and confused about them. I know how you feel, she said. 
feeling encouraged by the old woman's revelations. The ever afters can't be trusted. Livelings, that's Livling, that's not true, Granny said. Settle down, uh, Gr Granny Relda said, setting down her knife. Some of them are my friends. They are just like anyone else. They are fam they have families and home homes and dreams and murderous plots and kidnapping schemes and plans to destroy the town, Sabrina said. You don't really believe they're all bad, do you? What about Snow and the Sheriff? We haven't discovered what they're really up to yet. Sabrina, Granny Waldo reprimanded. No grandchild of mine is going to be a bigot. A bigot? Yes, you're judging all of their actions of a few, and that's bigotry and it's hateful. I know it is difficult when you don't know who is responsible, but that doesn't mean everyone is guilty. I have a right to hate them. They took my parents away. How can you defend them? Sabrina, uh, Sabrina cried as she jumped off the stool. I will defend them and anyone else, any, anyone else, excuse me, I will defend them and anyone else people choose to discriminate against. Yes, there are bad people among the ever afters, but there are bad people among us. It's not fair to paint all of us with the same brush. The kitchen suddenly seemed so small, as though they, um, it, though it wasn't a room for both of, a room enough for both of them anymore. Sabrina felt as if she was being suffocated. You can look at it any way you want, she said, taking a step backwards. But if they aren't all in, all in on it, then they sure aren't stepping up to help us. And every time you smile at one of them or shake one of their hands, you're making it easier for them to stab you in the back. Sabrina, Granny said, take it from an old woman who knows. Anger grows like a weed. If you don't get a hold of it and pull it back, it'll spread and choke to the life out of you. Hate is a dangerous thing. If you can't learn to control it, it will control you. I'll get a hold of my anger when my mom and dad are safe at home, the girl cried. She spun around and rushed out of the room and up the stairs. She slammed the door of her bedroom and threw herself on the bed. Burying her head underneath the pillow, she sobbed violently. In two weeks, it would be Christmas, the second Christmas since one of them one of the ever afters had kidnapped her parents. Why didn't anyone care about bringing him home? Why was she the only one who saw the truth about the ever afters? Hey kiddos, if you will do me a favor, I've got to stop this video so I can teach a Zoom class. And then if you will go ahead and click on the next link right below this one and you can finish the chapter.